All right, folks, so we're going to get started in a minute, but I wonder if it makes sense just to hear a few thoughts from people, not too long-winded, but either something that you learned earlier today that was interesting or an idea you had or, or anything you wanted to share. Just We're about to get started and just to give them a few more minutes. Does anyone want to share any, any thoughts they have about our first half day or <coughs> questions they have? gratitude uh, for the opportunity to be a part of this um, and to have so many uh, partners from around the nation seeing this as a, not just uh, a Kansas City deal, but it's something that's happening around the nation. So as part of the community state opportunity, um, we can have many opportunities to do a lot of things uh, with, with our partners around the nation, but uh, this is a great opportunity uh, to uh, be a part of this, particularly as we're getting involved with the economy. Can you introduce yourself also and Thank say maybe a word about CCO? Yes. My name is Stevie Wace. I'm a pastor of Kansas City, Kansas, and uh, um, Community Street Opportunity. Thank you. Community Street Opportunity is a faith based community organizing uh, collaborative about uh, Christian churches uh, in Kansas City, Kansas, and Missouri area. And uh, we uh, deal with many issues uh, that affect people's lives on the ground. So uh, I'm just glad to be part of this. So, uh, What was, somebody tell me, what was the, the thing that you learned in the opening session, session that, that uh, um, like the most interesting thing that you had never heard about before? <laughs> yeah, and introduce yourself, please. Yeah. My name is Leah Turner. I'm just going to be really excited about the hospital. Um, one thing that I learned was the need for community engagement with the volunteers that Other thoughts that people want to share, reactions, or interesting things you learned? Uh oh, we got the post lunch doldrums. Derek, I'm stalling for you here. I'm stalling for you, brother. Can you stand up and introduce yourself? I'm Ralph Fain from Action United. I also work with Back and Elsewhere. I'm a director and director of the Hospital Center. And I just want to say So, so, and that's what they're learning about, about right there across, across the way. And tomorrow, tomorrow no, no, and, and tomorrow, tomorrow we switch. switch. And so we'll do it in this group. Oh, good. So everybody, everybody gets a good vote. That's, that's exactly, exactly the issue that we're, that we're talking about over there. Um, other, other thoughts? thoughts? Yeah. You want to introduce yourself? What kind of unfair practices were those? Just, um, they, they're really quick to, to, not, to not take a plea. And you see um, how things can work out. I did I was a board Yeah, go ahead. 
My name is uh, Zaki Baruti, and I'm with the delegation from Moore. I'm head of an organization, Universal African Peace Organization, based out of St. Louis, Missouri. I just want to rise and uh, let's all give a collective uh, round of applause to uh, Andy for his vision and for his ability to bring together people from across the country. <laughs> Proportionate political representation that also has to mean at the Federal Reserve. Absolutely. And in Congress and the state legislature. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, thank, you thank, you thank, you thank you very much. much. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, the last, last comment is from Amador, Amador, and then we're going to get started. Amador. So I wanted to share with everyone, you know, we went to Washington, D.C., and there were there was a small group of us there that um, learned about the Federal Reserve. Me recuerdo que estaba reciente lo acontecido en Ferguson. Ferguson. Okay, and I remember um, that, you know, we were beginning to learn a lot more about what was happening in Ferguson and all the time. Things were heating up. Y todavía no había comenzado el movimiento Black, Black Lives Matter. And at that time, the Black Lives Matter movement has really yet to start in the capacity we have it now. Sin embargo, el grupo que se reunió con la eh, presidenta de la Reserva Federal. Que... Nevertheless, the group that was meeting with the Federal Reserve President le supo, supo explicarle, eh, enfrentarse, bueno, fue un enfrentamiento con los, los miembros de la, de, importantes de la Reserva Federal de que en, en ese momento que habían ocurrido los acontecimientos en Ferguson, el por qué habían ocurrido <coughs> Miller, Riverside, California, December 28, 1998, unarmed. Patrick Dorsman, New York, New York, March 16, 1999, unarmed. Ayanna Jones, Detroit, Michigan, May 16, 2010, unarmed. Remarley? Remarley. Remarley. Marley, 
cars render Wichita, Kansas, July 4th, unarmed. Bottom of the alley, New York, New York, February 4th, 1999, unarmed. These, only some, some of the names, names of many, 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 many scores scores of black, black people, people who have been shot down in the street, in the street. unarmed, without a weapon, without a reason. This, this is, is what, what Black, Black Lives, Lives Matter, Matter is about. It's about, it's about it's claiming, claiming that space, that space same, same the name of the, the people who the cops, cops have used their weapons to position the society to gun, to gun down, down without, without remorse, without, without, without accountability. accountability. And that's, and that's why we're here, to claim, claim those names, to say those names, to uphold, uphold and uplift, uplift those, those names. We talk, talk about, about the violence, violence that is done, done in the in our community. We talk about how there is a system of state-sanctioned state and state-sponsored violence against black and brown bodies. This system of state-sanctioned state state and state-sponsored state violence is not, not in, a in a vacuum. It is, it is part, part of a, of a larger, larger system, system, an economic system. It's part, part of, of an, an economic, economic violence, violence system. system. So when we we'll talk about the lives, lives that, are that are lost, when we we'll talk, talk about how, how people, people are struggling for their, for their lives, lives just, just to live, live to walk down the street black, to drive, drive your, your car, car black, black. to live, live in your, in your own neighborhood, neighborhood black. black. That is that in the context, context of living in, in a society, living, living in a world where, where at the same, same time, time you're struggling, struggling to pay your bills. At the same time, you're struggling, struggling to put, to put your, your children, children in, in school that help them learn, learn that help them get a leg up in life. At the same time, you're struggling to have a wage that is decent that, that is economic, economic violence, violence that is visited upon our community. That is on top, top of the, the violence, violence, the physical violence, violence the police brutality. And that's, and that's why, why we're, we're here. here. We're, we're here, here to, to talk about how there, there is, is a link, link between the economic, economic violence, violence, the violence, the violence of police, police brutality, brutality, and the economic violence in our community. That, that link, link, we say, leads right, right to, to the doors, doors of the Federal Reserve Bank. That they uh, have a mandate, mandate that, they that they are not following, that they are not including Black, black and brown, brown people in that, that mandate for full employment, for an for economy, economy that works for everyone. And that's why we're here today, to dramatize that, to bring that, that to, the to the Federal Reserve, Reserve and say, you must, must hear our voices. voices. You, you must, must hear what, what is important, important to us, us and you must act on it. So I'm going to put it over to Juan to, uh, to do the next part. Thank you very much. First, we're going to hear from a couple of speakers. Um, I'd like to call Rod Adams up uh, from Neighborhoods Organizing for Change. And, uh, Rod is going to talk a little bit about his uh, personal economic situation and how he is actually being affected um, um, in this economy. That mic on? Is the mic on? Mm -hmm. question here today is, do black lives matter to the feds? I mean, to the feds, I'm sorry. <laughs> they probably, probably do to the feds. Right? <laughs> um, and my answer is no. The, uh, the, I would say the lack of joy, joy that, I've, that I've been through over the last two and a half years, uh, seeing that me going to school and working two full-time jobs uh, and not being able to see like my family, not being able to see my daughter uh, because I can't find a job that will pay me enough to actually be able to have time to be free. I go home sometimes and I see my daughter and she says to me, um, Daddy, why can't you ever see me? Why don't I ever see you? And how do I explain to her? I mean, how do I explain to her that the reason I can't, I can't see you is because I'm not making enough money. The reason, the reason I can't, I can't see, see you is because the people, people who are, this is, this is power. power, the people who are creating policy have excluded, excluded an entire, entire group of people from this economic wonderland, we would call it. 
Back then, back then, remains that. We live in a country that is richer, more wealthy than any country in the history of this world. And people aren't making money. I've been through, I've been through working 80 hour work weeks. And then also finding time to write, write eight page sermon paper. Just imagine how stressful that is for you. Just imagine the, the, the stress, stress it puts on your body. body, mentally and physically, I was worn out. And I was worn oh. out without realizing I'm, I'm working. working a job that's leading nowhere. I'm working in, a, in an economic system that doesn't care about me, doesn't care about people who look like me. And that's something I feel like the Fed needs to actually sit down and have uh, an economic policy based on uh, race. Because, like, there's tons of white people. Like, in Minnesota, there's tons of, 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 of Caucasians who are doing really well. Then there's the lower class. And predominantly the lower, lower class, class is, is black. black folk. And I just want to know why why that is. So my, my question is, is, like, do the feds, do the fed care about black lives? And I don't believe that's true. I believe for us to, to work our way out of this... <laughs> I believe for us to work our way out of this entire conundrum, we have to come together like we did here today in Jackson Hole. All of our brothers and sisters, Latino brothers, Latino sisters, black brothers, black sisters come together and we push, we force the Fed to change their policies. Don't raise the interest rate. If you're gonna raise the interest rate, raise my wages. Cause, cause I'm sure everybody is no, no. Black wages matter. <laughs> you can say you black, say lives matter. Matter. black lives matter. Black lives matter, but black wages matter. Black people in this country are doing terrible. And we can't, without sitting at the table with, with the Fed, actually. actually create these policies and uh, dictate, dictate what's, what's going, going to be going on in this country, we can't make change. If you're not in a position of power, you're just a person being dictated to. And I can tell you right now, I'm tired of being dictated to. I'm tired of working two jobs. I'm tired of not being able to actually find a job that pays me enough where I can. I provide for myself and my family. And it pains me to see that there are many people in this room who went through the same thing. So what we need to do here today is make sure that the Fed hears our voices. What we did outside was great, but we, we need to stay on top of them until they understand that we, who we are. Everybody in this room is a powerful person. Everybody in this room can create change through the actions that they take over the next day, the next year. And I'm here to say, together, we can all make change. Thank you. Powerful testimony. Thank you, Rod. Uh, next, we're going to hear from somebody who has been uh, on the ground in Ferguson um, as an activist, uh, uh, kicking the issues uh, raised. We're going to hear from uh, Reggie Rounds, um, who's going to talk about uh, what it's been like being on the streets in Ferguson and now being here in Jackson Hole. I want to say that first, I'm honored to be here with all you people. We were here last year uh, with maybe like 10 or 12 people. And see all you is very powerful. Since that time, we've met Janet Yellen, James Blanchard, uh, President of Federal Reserve in St. Louis. And uh, we're, we're, this is what change looks like. We have to do this to change. But uh, I wasn't expecting to tell a story that I've told for quite a while now. Uh, I'm a resident of St. Louis, Missouri. My name is Reginald Rounds. Uh, I happen to be a veteran of the United States Army. I've had an associate degree in art since the 90s. I have a bachelor degree in sociology. I'm a recent graduate of St. Louis University School of Public Health. Social justice. justice. I have certificates uh, from everything. I'm, I'm, I have certifications from everything from first aid, CPR, to hazardous materials, to lead abatement and mold remediation, and many in between. And these are certifications uh, that I received. Uh, and uh, I'm unemployed. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, just to round this out, how I even got to uh, be here with you is because after my graduation, first of all, 
I was working a very laboring job as a machinist. I uh, wasn't paying. I was given permission from my uh, the owner of the company to go to school. I went to school and I was hoping to improve my wages, you know, and increase my wage, a uh, better rate of pay. Has not happened. Uh, I've been a tutor in St. Louis. I've been a coach. Uh, I, 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 I'm a God-fearing man, and uh, I, I'm not an angel or anything. It's, I try to make it like I'm all good and everything, but, I, but I've tried to live a, a righteous and uh, just life, and I've tried to educate myself and get back, back to, to my community. And uh, the story that you hear is like my story, story is different, different than anyone's, uh, many of your stories. And I, I want to bring this out to you that I went to school to get all these certifications in OSHA, Occupational Safety and Hazard Association, all these certificates and certifications, I hope to make some money. money. And the only time that I've made $15 an hour is when I work for a nonprofit organization, the Organization of Black Struggle, Missouri and Organized for Reform and Empowerment. Now, these organizations uh, have paid me $15 an hour. I've never been on a job to interview. Or I, I've never made $15 otherwise. Uh, in previous my previous life, life uh, uh, before all this took place, when I was just happy being a beer driver, I used to make a couple hundred dollars a day, uh, $200 a day. We you sold, sold us out, us out there. And uh, so I tried to um, make use of my social degree, my bachelor in sociology, you know? I'm thinking like, man, I'm in there. I'm not in there. We're not in there, and that's why we're here. And uh, I didn't say all this up to make you think so, so highly, highly of it, but I did work very hard to make, make those accomplishments. I had to work as I went to school. I graduated with 3.750 grade point average, so I diligently applied myself get the money, you know, so I can get paid. Has not happened. Like I said, the only time I made $15 an hour is when I worked for a nonprofit organization. So that means when I went to Wentzville and applied for General Motors, I didn't get hired. When I went to Monsanto uh, in St. Louis, I didn't get hired. Uh, when I went to these corporations and I did all my online work and I updated my resume and I, uh, you know, got all my things in order, it didn't work. So, very proud, very proud of you, you guys to move forward. And although I know some parts of this meeting may seem boring and, you know, time consuming, but uh, you guys have no idea of the progress that we're making. Uh, you have no idea uh, where we're going to go. We're going to get to where we need to be. And I don't sit around and sob about what I can get because I feel like I'm deserving to get a decent rate of pay. Uh, I'll continue doing this with no money uh, to make it better for the people to come behind us, the generations, all of us. And so uh, I just wanted to share that with you and let you know, man, I'm, I'm so very proud and honored to be here. When I look out here and look in you guys' faces and see these green shirts, man, it's just like uh, it's very very motivation very motivational for me. And I will continue. Uh, to be um, active in whatever needs that uh, we need to address in our community. And I'll, I'll close. I'm supposed to be short. I'm, I'm kind of long-winded. I'm the wrong person to have up here for five minutes. Uh, but I want to let you know, guys, that we work very hard uh, with the people of Ferguson and the people of the city of St. Louis when uh, that incident. I actually lived in that apartment complex when Michael Brown was killed. I lived in Canfield. And so we worked hard, more organization of Black Struggle, the brothers like and Rudy, and other organizations, and many people uh, in St. Louis, we all work together. together. We accomplished very little in that city. And uh, no justice was given for Michael, Michael Brown's family, or the people in that community. All Thanks the things you guys, you guys saw, saw on the news are currently basically just the way you saw them. They're still burnt down, they're not revived, uh, there's no hope for job creation. Um, we have a, uh, some type of committee that they set up in Ferguson, and we're getting nowhere, uh, but uh, we must continue to fight. And so um, let's just continue to do what we have to do to make a difference with this, what we're doing. And I thank you all so very much. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so as you guys are learning, um, many people are, are really impacted economically.
economically, um, regardless of the educational background, um, doing the right thing, going to school, you know, that old adage, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, we've done that. We've been pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps, and look where it's gotten us. Uh, we, we're still in the situation of, of joblessness. Um, so we're going to keep it moving. Um, we're going to go into our panel session. Um, we have two people on our panel today. Uh, the first person who is going to share her story is Angela McCall from Moore out of St. Louis. Um, the second person that we're going to hear from is William Spriggs. Um, William Spriggs is the chief economist at the AFL-CIO. Uh, he's a professor and former chair of the Department of Economics at Howard University. Bill assumed these roles in August 2012 after leaving the executive branch of the U.S. government. A bill was appointed by President Barack Obama and confirmed by the U.S. Senate in 2009 to serve as Assistant Secretary for the Office of Policy at the United States Department of Labor, taking a leave of absence from Howard University to do so. At the time of his appointment, he also served as Chairman for the Healthcare Trust for UAW Retirees of the Ford Motor Company and as Chairman of the UAW Retirees of the Dana Corporation Health and Welfare Trust, Vice Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Political Education and Leadership Institute, and on the Joint National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Public Administrations Committee on the Fiscal Future for the United States and the UFCW National Commission on Ice Misconduct, and as a Senior Fellow of the Community Service Society of New York, served on boards of the National Employment Law Project and an Eastern Economic Association. Bill's previous work experience includes roles leading economic policy development and research as a senior fellow and economist at the Economic Policy Institute, as executive director for the Institute for Opportunity and uh, Equality of the National Urban League, as senior advisor for the Office of Government Contracting and Minority Business Development for the U.S. Small Business Administration, and as a senior advisor and economist for the Economics and Statistics Administration for the U.S. Department of Commerce, as an e economist, as a Democratic staff a Joint Economic Committee of Congress, and as staff director for Independent Federal National Commission for Employment Policy. Uh, while working on his PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin, Bill began his labor career as co-president of the American Federation of Teachers, Local 3220 in Madison, Wisconsin. He's also a member of the National Academy of Social Insurance and the National Administration. So if you give me a round of applause for Mr. Williams. <laughs> Two years or more. 
Um, you, may, you may have experienced companies that increased the working hours of their employees because they weren't able to hire on new employees. And so these um, employees had to break longer hours, which resulted in family time being uh, depleted. Your social life with friends and family being uh, in non-existence, causing a lot of stress, which affects your health. Health is huge. When you, when you don't have a job, when you don't have money, when you have responsibilities, the, what it's doing to your health, your physical health, your mental health, is insurmountable. And it's something that's not being discussed. That's another entire factor that the Fed really needs to uh, be pointed out to them, that it's affecting our health. It's affecting the health in the communities. So you, you'll see companies that increase employee workloads, uh, employees working the job with one, two, three people. I've experienced that myself. I, I probably had the job of four people at the time um, around the recession. So a lot of jobs op overlap their job duties um, to make up for the vacant positions they were not able to fill because money wasn't there to be used for hiring. Starting salaries do not commensurate with experience. Um, companies were pretty much taking advantage of their employees. And they took advantage, not just of the employee, but they took advantage of the employee's happiness and enjoyment in life for their hard work. These companies would take shortcuts and, and would, would cause hazards within the company to where an uh, employee could get hurt or, or something more catastrophic could occur. And you, you have these employees having to suffer through these pay freezes um, for a long period of time and working and doing extra jobs. And on top of that, doing jobs where they weren't being paid for the pay scale that they should have been paid for. So minimal pay raises, if you did uh, receive any, any pay raise, that was very minimal. And then the, the uh, atmosphere of the work environment itself, just, just hard. Everybody's mad at each other. Things aren't getting done. Somebody's uh, fussing and complaining about this. And I used to be in HR, so I know. <laughs> I, I uh, you know, would experience that and uh, would have to um, handle employees in, in, in the matter of those things. Um, so a lot of times you, you're just stressed. You're not able to efficiently and effectively do your job that you're paid to do because you're so stressed out being uh, overloaded with work and uh, being forced to work overtime. And spending, like I said earlier, spending time with your family, cooking dinner, making sure homework is done, being exhausted. Some of you may have uh, faced being burnt out on top of other hurdles that's being uh, thrown your way. You still have utilities, you have car payments, car insurance, and, um, you can't just say, you know, stop and say, I'm, I'm going to look for a, stre a less stressful job because so many jobs are out there are just filled with stress, filled with so many um, things that, that will, will diminish your quality of life. Um, I myself um, had, had the experience of working in very stressful jobs and taking on other roles and not getting the higher pay that I deserve. Not, not being able to afford health insurance and dealing with health uh, situations that um, decreased, increased over time. And so um, after a long time being in that stressful environment, the first interview I went on, the uh, interviewer looked at me and he, the first words out of his mouth was that you're tired. He looked at my resume, he saw all the things that I did, and he's like, you're tired. And at that time, I wanted to just cry, you know, but I had to keep my professional face on and smile. And he brought somebody in uh, to interview me also, and she walked out. She was like, she has no personality. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know, so so all the stress that um, occurred during that time, during the recession that I, 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 I faced uh, working really four or five different positions, um, it, it, it took a toll on me. Somebody said today, I'm tired. I still haven't recovered. It takes years. When you're, you're, you're bogged down with a bunch of stress, 
that stress is not going to disappear by vacation. You're a vacation man. Um, and so, like I said, my uh, health issues worsened um, to the point to where I started having numbness in my hands and my fingers and arms and all kind of different situations were going on. Um, so racism is a huge issue. And I actually uh, spoke with Bill Spriggs. Uh, well, not what well, I did speak with him for a little bit, and he emailed me an article where he said that um, employees will likely pick the people who they're more comfortable with. So if you have, um, and I, I don't, I, I hope I'm saying it right, Bill. So, <laughs> but basically, you know, a lot of uh, corporate America, they're going to choose to hire the white folks if it's a predominantly white company, they're going to hire somebody that's white because they're more comfortable with that person. And it's not based on the education or experience primarily, but it's based on race. And I also experienced that where a white employee uh, was a part of the decision making process. And he, we had a white candidate and a black candidate. Two, both of them were young, both were freshly out, out, freshly out of college. And he uh, directly told me that they hired the white girl because they were more comfortable with her. Um, so the chances of a minority being hired in, um, decreases when there's a less uh, uh, job openings in corporate America. So we really need to uh, have the Fed take it serious when we say we need the unemployment rate, the true rate for minorities, for black Americans to be um, considered we, it's, a, it's a serious statement because of the racial situation that's going on. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but I'm fed up. Y'all yeah. fed up? Yeah. yeah. All right, these stories are hiring. Um, these stories um, are heartbreaking over and over again, you know, these people went and invested money into going to school, you know, they can't pay back soon longer, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so we are drowning um, in so many different ways. So uh, without further ado, we're going to have uh, Bill Spriggs go over his presentation, and he's going to dig into some of the fallacies um, uh, around in black employment. And then after that, I want to tell the rest, we're asking, there's going to be time for conversation and yeah, yeah, we'll have some time for conversations. We're also going to do a breakout session uh, so we can kind of dig into this issue a little bit deeper and, uh, and develop some action steps as far as what we can do as a community to be able to uh, counteract some of these problems. Okay, okay so, thank, so you thank you very, you very much. much. I appreciate it that you have invited me, and I appreciate the stories that we heard. Uh, but I want you to go back to how we opened. We opened with recounting why the Black Lives Matter movement got started. So just understand this. This is a movement because Black lives can be taken with impunity. It's not just that the names you heard were killed unarmed, nothing. Happened. Did they spend a day in jail? Half a minute in jail? No. No one was held accountable. Involving grand juries. Involving juries. The different cases that you heard, some of them even went to trial. So this isn't just one person, it's not two, it wasn't one part of the country. So understand what you're saying. You're saying that I can take the lie of a black person, an unarmed black person, on video, on video. We watched Eric Garner say, I can't breathe. The grand jury said, Allison, what was the problem? What did the police do wrong? 
I didn't see anything happen. Wrong. If that, that can happen. happen, do you think, do you think when you apply for a job, mm -hmm. you have suddenly become something different? Mm -hmm. If I can kill you with impunity, you are a cockroach. Mm -hmm. If I kill a dog, mm -hmm. we saw what happened to Michael Bitt. If I kill a dog, mm -hmm. something's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can kill that people are going to go, oh, would be a cockroach. So understand, Black Lives Matter, well, if you get that, then you get that you can't expect that the labor market operates fairly. That would be a different world. Now, I'm going to say some things which you aren't used to hearing, and sometimes it may sound insensitive. But please remember what you just heard. You just heard from four college graduates with multiple degrees and lots of experience who could not find a job. So often in our community, when we talk to the Fed, we don't understand Fed speak. If you talk to the Fed and you want to talk about high school dropouts who don't have skills, you will get from the Fed, we can't solve that problem. Because what the Fed does in its view is it increases economic activity, which means that firms go to hire people and if you tell me, well, the problem is black people don't have any skills. Massive, we don't know how to do nothing. Well, I can't expand the economy to get you a job because you can't do nothing. This is not the truth. It would be equivalent in a Black Lives Matter setting. It actually would be worse. But if someone said, I don't get your, get your move. Y'all should be talking about black on black crime. You should be talking about the 100 black people who got killed in DC. I don't understand your movement. You're wasting time. It would be that equivalent. If you want to talk about Black Lives Matter and talk about unemployment, then you have to talk about discrimination. Now, we know that the black to white unemployment rate stays two to one, but the numbers are more disturbing than that, and they are deeper than that, and when we do it two to one, it sounds like it is also something that can't be solved. And what the Fed will say to you, oh, it's always two to one, no matter what we do, it's two to one. And as you heard Dean Baker explain, even if we get the unemployment rate down to 4%, and everybody else, y'all is going to be 8%, you won't be happy. And so there's nothing we can do. But there is, when you look at the data, deeper. So you heard from people who have worked hard because they, they heard, heard their, mama. their mama, they're all going to say this is true, you got to be twice, twice as good. good. So they set out to be twice, twice as good. good. The unemployment disparity between Black blacks and whites is so, so extreme that, that the, the un unemployment rates for blacks with more more education, education looks, looks like the like unemployment rates of whites with less education. Mm -hmm. This isn't simply a matter of we have slightly higher unemployment rates. We have unemployment rates which live up to, you got to be twice as good. Now, I'm going to talk about college graduates. Some of you will want to say digital divide. Let me be clear about this. You send a black kid off to school, and I know this because I, I, my entire teaching career has been about universities. You send a kid off to college, and you're going to borrow money for them to go to college. What can they major in? Basket weaving is not on the list. Accounting, because everybody knows accounting, CPAs. Do something to become a lawyer. Do something to become a doctor. Computers. Every black parent has heard this for the last 35 years. 11% of the undergraduate degrees awarded in the United States to American citizens, 11% of those go to black Americans. We're 11% of the workforce. We're not 11% of college graduates. We are overrepresented in computer science. There are more black people employed in computer occupations, occupations than blacks in 
public school, elementary, and middle school teaching. There are more black people with the skill to be employed in computer occupations than there are blacks employed as public middle school and elementary school teachers. So please do not tell me there's a digital divide. You may not be able to do it, but there are a lot of black people who do it. So this is what the unemployment rate looks like for black college graduates compared to whites with less education. This dark line is tracing out for you how many people are unemployed compared to how many job openings are in the economy. When we're below two, meaning that two people show up for one job opening, we're getting closer to what would be a really, really super tight labor market. Here's the Great Recession. Over six people showing up for each job opening. This is musical chairs. If six people show up to get, to get into one chair, somebody has to stand up. Now, is it going to be a fair game in deciding which five people stand up? This red line is the difference between the unemployment rate of black college graduates and whites who have an associate's degree twice as good. The blue line is the difference between the unemployment rate of black college graduates and white high school, high school. High school. High school graduates. When the economy is tight, is tight so you notice that, <laughs> that we actually get to live the one to one. We get to be twice as good. The unemployment rate, rate for blacks, blacks with college degrees, we can go to one more slide. One more. Okay. When the labor market is tight, the unemployment rate for blacks with college degrees is, is essentially at the level for whites with an associate's degree. So it falls. When the labor market gets tighter, we actually get this ability to finally be twice as good. Here we are out in a less tight market. Next slide. This is the unemployment rate for whites with a high school degree. The unemployment rate for blacks with college degrees gets to the unemployment rate for whites with high school, high school degrees when the labor market is slack. Now, it's not totally a picture of we could never reach equality. Notice every time that we get close, these are smoothed out, so there are 12 months averages. But when you look, when the labor market is tight, black college graduates actually do better than whites with associate degrees for a couple of months. The problem is, as we were talking about before, every time we get to these two places here, the Fed said, oh, we're at full employment. So just as we thought we were going to make progress and get our unemployment rates to be equal, boom. Job openings disappear, unemployed people increase. Our disadvantage gets bigger, even compared to people less educated. educated. Now, that does not mean that the Fed can't get us to equality. If they include it in their measure of full employment, what economists know should be true. At full employment, I don't have time to worry about what you are because at full employment, I have customers and I need somebody. We're worried about who you are after that. If you keep pulling the punch bowl away, we never get there. This, I'm going to show you about the role of education 
So I apologize, we're gonna get really super wonky here. But I'm doing it for youngsters because that's the group we often care the most about. And it's the group that we often immediately say, it's education, blacks don't have the education. This is equivalent in the Black Lives Matter language of you saying, see, here's the problem. When the police officer pulls you over, y'all got the wrong response. We know this actually happens because we have the data from the stop and frisk. And so we know how people responded because the police officer were forced to write that down. So we know that when they stop young black men for the third time that same day, that the response goes from yes officer to what the F are you stopping? Okay? Because it is right? right? Okay. Okay. So I now mean, people say, well, y'all got the wrong response. That's the same as you don't have the right education. Okay? So this is Black the black kind of point rate, 16 to 24 year olds not enrolled in school. So these are people already finished school. Some of them unfortunately have dropped out. But these are people who aren't doing school anymore, young people. This is what the unemployment rate looked like in July. This is the most recent data that we have. So the unemployment rate for black teen, black young people, these are 16 to 24 year olds, but not teen. 16 to 24 is about 23%. For whites, it's 11%. Now, how did we get to the 23%? Next slide. Well, <clears throat> if you look, more education, lower unemployment rates. So it's true for African Americans, as it is for everybody else, you get more education, your chances of finding a job get better, your unemployment rate falls. So black black clouds clouds have, have an unbelievable 40% unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. High school graduates who haven't gone on to college, 28%. Those who have some college, 13%. Those with a bachelor's degree, it's 12%. Notice the overall unemployment rate for whites was 11.3%. Even if your policy was, okay, so then what we're gonna do is whatever it takes, we're gonna give all black people college degrees. All y'all gonna get to, get to go to college, we're gonna get everybody to finish. You're still gonna have a higher unemployment. That 12 is bigger than the unemployment rate. Even if I said, we're going to get you all bachelor's degrees. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so now how do we translate these things uh, to get the unemployment rate? Uh, so this is the unemployment rates I just mentioned. The next button gets me the share of the labor force. And we are as rational as anybody else, seeing these very high unemployment rates, very low wages. Blacks are a very small share who drop out. Most blacks do finish high school. Another big group have some college or an associate's degree. And a smaller share have an actual bachelor's degree. These are 24 and under. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, I wanted, I to, wanted lower. to lower the black unemployment rate. This is why people argue about its education. Well, well notice. notice this group has a very high unemployment rate. So if I could shift people out of this group, if I had fewer people with this very high rate, and I could shift them to groups that had lower unemployment rates, then I could make the overall unemployment rate a smaller number. That's the idea behind black education isn't what it should be. And if I could get it equal to the white education, I could get the black unemployment rate down. That's why you hear this. Okay, so how does that work out? And now I have my trusty bricks to explain it to you. Let's go back. Let's go back one. Okay. So I got 40% unemployment rate among 15% share of the labor force. I got 15 blocks here. These 15 blocks. blocks represent high school dropouts. The red blocks is saying 40% of them. So this is 40% times the 15. That's what the red blocks are. These are the other four. 
44% are, are high school graduates. That's this group of folks here. 28% of them are unemployed. If I take the 28 times the 44, I get the red blocks that you see here. These are the unemployed high school grads. 31%, that's the 31 blocks here. These 31 are those who have some college. 13% of them are unemployed. This four red blacks represents the 13% of that 31%. And finally, these nine blocks over here, these are our college grads. 12% of them are unemployed. Are unemployed. That, gets that gets me my 1% contribution to the unemployment rate. So if add, I add, add my red blocks, blocks here, I'm going to get that I have six red blocks here. I have 13 red blocks here. I have four and I have one. That's my unemployment rate that we mentioned, the 23%. So, so the idea is I sure, sure unemployed here. Let's get from the group with a high unemployment rate, get them over to the groups with a lower unemployment rate, and then I'll have fewer red blocks. Okay? Okay, next slide. Okay, so that's what this would look like if I didn't have all the blocks same color, but that would be very expensive to have that many blocks. So this is the way you see it. Okay? Okay, let's go next. So we're going to take Unemployment rate times the share of the labor force. Okay, this is the red block, and this is the share of the labor force. So we're just multiplying these two to get the unemployed. Okay? So let's click it real fast. So click it. So this is our overall unemployment rate. You'll see a big chunk comes from here, the high school dropouts. Next big trunk, trunk from high school graduates, some college, and then the little one block from the college graduates. All right? We're all together. Okay. Let's, Let's now, now to experience. Let's shift the black blocks so that blocks now have the education of whites. But, but you're still black. Okay? So when the police officer pulls you over, yes, officer, nice day we're having. Hope the Cardinals are doing well. <laughs> to which you're still going to get the same response. Get out, get out of my car! Okay? Because you're still black. Okay, next step. So this is the black, black unemployment rate. This is the white share of the labor force. Next slide. This is the black share of the labor force. So you can see, because whites who finish high school actually go on at a slightly higher rate than this group to get some college or to finish college, college there are fewer in the high, in high school group because they're showing up in college and more specifically as people who finish college. Lower unemployment rates, we're going to shift people from this group with a higher unemployment rate to these groups with a lower unemployment rate. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So let's do the slide. So I'm going to make the shift with these blocks here. These are the high school grads. We're going to have fewer of them. And we're going to shift them to people with more education. Some college, and you're going to see the college stack is going to get much bigger. So I took them from high school. There are fewer of them now. There are 36 of them. But they still have the black unemployment rate. So I have 10 blocks here, 10 red blocks here. I'm going to now 
shift them over to the college group because that's where the stack thing gets bigger. So we're going to move those people over here. So four high school grads, more college grads. The college grads, remember, had the lowest unemployment rate. Let's add up our red blocks and see what happened when we did that. We kept the same percentage unemployed in each one, but we moved them from the high unemployment to low unemployment. Okay? So that's this block over here. <laughs> I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. I went from 23 red blocks to 22 red blocks. Victory! That's the policy. Thank I got you, you the, the educational fight votes. You even got the unemployment rate. Pretty much a black person. It didn't change that much. Education simply doesn't hold it. Now, let's do a second experiment. I'm going to keep you as black. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep you as black, but. but this time, this time, this time when I get your resume, see last time, right, I gave you the education. I got you the college degree, but I still said, where did that resume say? Keyshawn, Keyshawn, trash. Okay, this time, I mean, treat you differently. differently. This time, all I'm gonna do is say, does it say bachelor's in computer science? That's all I wanna know. Don't tell me nothing else. That's all I wanna know. Is the police officer pulling you over and saying, ma'am, I want you to know your left tail light was out. Now I'm going to write you a warning, only so when you talk to the mechanic, he knows specifically what I saw so you, you can get it fixed. Y'all have a nice day. Okay? I'm going to treat you like I would treat anybody else. Same education, though. I'm just going to treat you equal. Okay, so let's let's take a pause because I gotta rearrange the bricks and let's see what happens when I do that. So now I'm not change your education. We're back to the stacks the way they were in terms of black high school graduates, dropouts, some college, college. But I'm treating you, you're getting the right unemployment rate for each of those education levels. Okay?
So how many red blocks do I have at the top? I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I went from 23% unemployment to 12% unemployment. From 23 to 12. I almost cut it in half. Simply by saying, I'm just going to treat you the same. Now, 11% unemployment rate for 16 to 24 year olds, that's still a high unemployment rate. But now, the gap. Well, you have a 12% unemployment rate. Whites have an 11% unemployment rate. It's not twice. It's not twice. So, what would what happen if the Fed understood that this unemployment rate that we see, this is the result of us not getting the message. It's not the result of us not listening to my mom and saying, you know, you gotta be twice as good. It's not listening to people saying things like, you're not doing your part. Why don't you get the education? Didn't you get the message? Didn't you get the memo? You have four college graduates up here who got the memo. The memo we didn't get was the memo that should have been sent to the employers. A tighter labor market means that we can finally have some help on our side. Now from the labor movement perspective, I'm wrapping up, from the labor movement perspective, this is important, and we've talked about the labor movement a lot, because first thing we know as a labor union is do not let the boss choose the workers. Because the boss will choose, they'll choose, they'll choose their workers. This is, this is not a good deal. You're putting the boss in charge. We don't want a labor market where the bosses choose, where the boss can say, oh, I know they got a college, but I'll, I'll wait. I'll try and find somebody else. If they are picking, we all as workers lose. If the Fed continues to say that the only thing we're worried about is whether we see wages rise, then they're going to stop too soon. We must, we must see wages, wages rise, but we must also, also see. see that employers find out that they cannot discriminate. It's too costly, and they have, have to. They have, have to change the these relative unemployment rates. You cannot get the black, get the black unemployment rate. rate down unless you first say those relative unemployment rates have to get down. Then we can have a conversation. Just like in Black Lives Matter, you have to say you ain't gonna shoot me first. first. Then we then can have, we have a conversation. conversation. So let's be consistent in our messages on Black Lives Matter. It matters at the job, when I get hired, it matters in justice. And let's be consistent that we're always demanding justice. Thank you. Stuff, stuff, stuff. Thank, Thank you, Bill. Bill. Um, how y'all feeling? Good. I ain't going to sleep on it. Sorry, y'all. Yeah, yeah, stretch out, out a little bit. Stand, Stand up, up, Bill. 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 Uh, we're going to spend about five minutes with questions, and then we're going to move into a little bit of breakout sessions because we want to give you guys an opportunity to engage with one another. So uh, I'm going to ask you uh, to spend about uh, 10 minutes with people at your tables. Uh, who took the mic? Can you turn the lights out on me? No. <laughs> um, we're going to spend about 10 minutes with people at your tables, and I'm going to ask you uh, to go over a couple of questions. But first, again, we're going to spend about five minutes with questions. Does anybody have any questions for Bill? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, what specific way can the governor and the other employees are fair to employees? Well, we actually have an opportunity commission, which is supposed to enforce laws against discrimination. So we know that a lot of employers, employers have been putting in place screens which which appear to be for disparate impact. That is, I do something that would over affect the, 
the black population relative to the white population. So they say things like criminal background check, or I will do a, a drug test on you. Uh, but we do know, know that, that when, when employers are actually given a choice, they would take a white man with a criminal record over a black man with no criminal, criminal record. record and more education. We've done those tests. So the criminal background operates less as a disparate impact. It's a screen to scare you away from going after me and saying I discriminated against you. So I, I can scare away black applicants. When the reality is, it's gonna be a disparate outcome. That is, I don't care what you got, I'm still not gonna hire you. Oh. So in locality after locality, they've tried to get rid of the smoke screens so we can get at the heart of what the employers are really doing. So banning the box is one way to make sure that that smoke screen doesn't allow the employer to get away with this illusion. Credit scores has been another area because black credit scores are lower. We are less banked. banked. If you are less banked, then you will have a lower credit score. The credit score is meant to punish you if you don't do business with the bank. So part of it is trying to go after those things. So. In Washington, D.C., as an example, they have made it so that employers are not supposed to do the credit check. They're not supposed to do the, they're supposed to ban the box, and they're not supposed to do marijuana drug tests because marijuana is not legal in D.C. So those, those are ways, are ways to, get to get rid of the smoke screen and get back to being able to detect when the employer is active, actively discriminating. But we must be more vigilant and we must get people to be serious about discrimination. Mm -hmm. Is it legal for an employer to ban Well, the, work, the workforce should, should look like the applicant pool. So, I mean, it, the, the test that the EOC would be upon would be what did the applicant pool look like. And so if the applicant pool was, then another test that the EOC could do is to see whether they're, because it, it's required to do affirmative action, am I really reaching out? Does my applicant pool not have any black applicants because I never I never posted the job where I might find black applicants. And so I've done something to make the pool look smaller. Silicon Valley, where Google claims to be the world's best search engine, right? They, they have like fewer than 3% blacks. I just told you 11% of people getting a degree are black. If you go to Prince George's County and the DMV, the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia, if you go to that high-tech corridor, which is equal in size to Silicon Valley and does things which are as complex, the computer workforce is 20% black. So if people in Prince George's can find 20% black and people in Silicon Valley can only find four, it's not your applicant pool. It must be you didn't look where they were and your applicant pool is being biased against finding those people. So those are the types of tests they apply. The Office of Federal Contract Compliance is supposed to enforce this specifically where the company is a subcontractor or a contractor with the federal government, which is a large share of American corporations, a big share. Because if, even if they aren't, then they're a subcontractor to the big contractor. And, and it is always important to raise issues with the local OFCCP office if you think that this discrimination is going on. Sorry, Sorry we don't, we don't have, have any more time for questions. Um, we got to move on to the breakout session. I want you guys to ask your questions of the, uh, to the people that are just sitting at the, at the table. Um, the, 
know, to, to engage with, with one another. But I want to, I want you guys to ask two things of one another. We learned a lot today about um, um, what we can do to kind of um, counteract some of the issues that we're dealing with, as well as uh, about tightening the labor market. Uh, what I want you to expound on is, uh, besides tightening the labor market, what can we do as a coalition uh, to uh, hold the Fed accountable? So I'd like for you to spend um, about 10 minutes with the people at your table reflecting over what you learned today um, and come up with a couple of ideas. And then we're going to give you an opportunity to, to share what you all have come up with. So we're going to ask one person from each table uh, to share. So spend about 10 minutes uh, discussing what you've learned today and um, what besides maintaining the labor market uh, do you think we, we need to do? Thank you. 
because the conversations are still going on. Uh, uh, obviously, we didn't, didn't have a ton of time, but we did uh, talk about a okay, couple so, things. So, uh, uh, one of the questions was, how, how do you get this? This uh, What do we do? So, we're talking about public, public education. education. How, do you, how do you get, get that, that public education? Because, you know, things like $15 an hour is easy to understand. Things like a fair work week is easy to understand. And the Fed is, is, is kind, of, kind of a huge, uh, uh, mysterious, mysterious thing. And it's not a se sexy topic. So we talk public about public education, education, and the thing to do is to simplify. 
for your members, down, boil it down, it down to increased jobs and increased wages. The Fed can use its uh, lever for monetary policy to help increase jobs and wages. The other thing we got to was talking about bringing pressure to elected, so engage the political process, uh, running for office, like with, with the black folks, running for, running the, highest for the highest levels of office they can. There are Senate seat, uh, uh, state Senate seats, uh, there's uh, the federal government, the Senate and the Congress, uh, seats available, run for those offices. We, we, we can increase oh, the profile wow, wow. of black, black folks. We can raise the, elevate the conversation of black, of black Lives Matter, elevate the conversation about those things. <laughs> Oh, oh, everybody, everybody translating. I can't translate all that. Okay. So, uh, bring pressure on the elected officials. Uh, and uh, we can run for office. Black people can elevate the conversation. We can make it a priority for candidates. Push them, push them to take a stand on the Federal Reserve Bank and the policies that they are doing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I mean, I still need you to describe them. We're gonna take two for other. Yeah. We're gonna take two more. Uh, let's have this group over here who wants to share. So, what we have to what we're talking about, and actually, what the message of the national decision will make. Hold on a second. You gotta stop. Mike, stop. Thank you. Sorry. You wanna come up front, please? You wanna go ahead and come up front? Give us your name. My name is Mary Raybon. I'm from the Kansas City CCO. And what we were talking about in our group was that we, before we start saying what they can do or what they can't do or what we want them to do, we need to know who they are. We need to know the people who are the decision makers who put these people on the Federal Reserve Board. And that way, we'll know how to attack it as far as getting people on there that look like us. And uh, so we're gonna all go back to where we where we live and, and get as much information as possible. We're sharing uh, email addresses and, and we're gonna keep informed until, until we meet again. There was also a lot of talk about education, um, how we should um, be running our movement in education, educating our young folks and uh, the people that are, are interested in being involved involved with, you know, stuff like this. Um, my, me, myself, I definitely am not really educated when it comes to the feds or anything like that. So um, I welcome <laughs> teachings and, you know, stuff like that. But that's really important. Like he said, you know, just that that should be the foundation of everything in educating so people are aware, so. Okay, and uh, let's take this group in the back in the corner. Do you guys want to share? And we want you to have a wrap and get anybody to report. Steve, Steve, you want to come on the front, 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 front,